on this Sunday night, defying the COVID-19 rules. The car rally that put hundreds at risk. They basically took over the, the community. Plus the hundreds potentially exposed at a restaurant in a province with climbing cases. The success story, how the Atlantic bubble is allowing classes to go ahead as normal. The WHO's dire warning as the global COVID-19 death toll approaches a terrible milestone. There is a lot that can be done to save lives. The real question is, are we prepared collectively to do what it takes. And Mini Moon, the object headed into Earth's orbit. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin with new signs of trouble in Canada's fight against COVID-19. Despite repeated public health warnings and efforts to slow the resurgence, infections are still spiking in Canada's biggest provinces. Over the past 24 hours, nearly 900 people in Quebec tested positive. That's the biggest jump since early May. Ontario also reported a major spike today. 491 new cases. There were 51 new cases in Manitoba and 15 in Saskatchewan. Out west, the most recent daily case numbers are from Friday when there were 153 cases in Alberta and 98 in BC. Canada's chief public health officer is urging everyone to reduce our contacts and take every measure possible to help slow the spread of the virus before it gets out of control. But some people just aren't getting the message. In Ontario, for the second weekend in a row, police were called in after hundreds of people ignored warnings and gathered for a car rally. Global's Catherine Ward has tonight's top story. It's just a recipe for uh, A, people getting sick or people getting injured or killed. Police and politicians had a heads up an unsanctioned car rally was a possibility in Wasaga Beach, Ontario this weekend. But they had no idea how many people might actually attend. Saturday, they got their answer. There was a smoke show, squealing tires, um, people walking with cameras in amongst the, the traffic on the roads. Um, there, there was literally um, no, no control of the situation. For officers, it was a flashback to one week ago when another unauthorized car rally took over the parking lot outside a movie theater in Ancaster. They say organizers of that event could face a $10,000 fine, but so far, no one has been charged. Back in Wasaga, tire marks on the road are just some of the evidence of what took place. Officers handed out several tickets for driving offenses and for breaking the pandemic gathering limits imposed by the province. At one point, the town was effectively shut down and no one was allowed to enter unless they were a resident. Police say for large rallies like this one, it's a challenge to hold every single person accountable. It's difficult for us to get a handle on it because just the sheer numbers. I mean, it's a takeover mentality, and they do. They take over and overwhelm law enforcement with just sheer numbers. Doctors say if meetups like this continue, it will only make the fight against COVID-19 more difficult. We know this far into the epidemic to put, put on a mask, to spread apart by two meters, to wash your hands, to avoid large crowds. And we sort of think about that checklist, we sort of see some significant errors uh, from on, on many of those points with, uh, with that gathering yesterday. What experts say they know is that simply telling people to follow the rules won't necessarily work. They say a lot more effort and resources needs to be put into crafting messages that stick. The most effective way for people to follow the rules is if the rules are sort of given to the people over the long term so that they're able to sort of absorb them, internalize them. Rather than point fingers and, and play the shame and blame game, I really think that we need to take a step back and reevaluate how we're communicating these messages, the modes of communication. Until that happens, police say they plan to do everything in their power to find those responsible. So rallies like this continue to be discouraged. This investigation isn't isn't over just because the cars have left Wasega Beach. This will be ongoing of people examining video and identifying drivers and, and uh, uh, trying to figure out who the ringleaders are. Catherine Ward, Global News, Toronto. In Toronto, around 600 people are being told to monitor for symptoms after potentially being exposed at a downtown bar. Public health officials released the warning today after three staff members at the regulars bar tested positive. Yesterday, officials warned that five staff members and two patrons at a restaurant on Young Street tested positive. In that case, 1,700 people have been told to monitor themselves for two weeks. 
Canada's Atlantic provinces are keeping new cases at bay. The four provinces, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland and Labrador created a bubble at the beginning of July, monitoring and restricting movements in and out of the region. Now, as Ross Lord reports, that move has allowed university students to head back to class with some normalcy. St. Francis Xavier in Nova Scotia is doing something most Canadian universities only wish they could emulate, offering most classes in person. We came to a balance of 70% face-to-face and 30% of our classes online. President Andy Haken says St. FX leads the country in preserving old school education, a distinction made possible by the Atlantic bubble, a collective effort by Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland and Labrador to monitor and restrict travel in and out of the region. As the virus rolls through Canada, accelerating the number of new cases, the Atlantic region is mostly COVID free. It's become normal for each of the four provinces to go days or even weeks at times without any new cases. A key part of St. FX's plan is testing every student arriving from outside Atlantic Canada three times, whether they have symptoms or not. It's mandatory at the moment to wear masks on campus. We've had a good campaign going called Neighbour, helping, help, helping neighbours. And what, is, what that does is to remind students, wear the mask, wash your hands and social distance when you're on campus. More than two weeks after classes started, there are no outbreaks, giving students bragging rights with their families. Well, uh, Tom made the right decision coming out east instead of staying in Ontario. As long as everybody's wearing their masks and keeping distance, then it's not too bad, as long as people are following the rules. There have been violations, and a small number of students fined for failing to self-isolate after coming to campus. But officials say St. FX's location in the fairly isolated town of Anaganish helps its odds of suppressing the virus. We're saying to our students, if you don't have to travel outside of Anaganish, don't do it. And that's the message we're putting out for Thanksgiving as well. Guarding against complacency while enjoying success. Ross Lohr, Global News, Antigonish, Nova Scotia. The CERB, which served more than 8 million people over the past six months, has now come to an end. Canadians still needing financial assistance have to transition to a different program. Most people who receive the benefit will be rolled into EI, which has been expanded to include more people. Canadians who don't qualify for EI but still can't work because of the pandemic can apply for three new temporary programs. The Canada Recovery Benefit, the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit, and the Canada Recovery Caregiving Benefit. The world is approaching a disturbing new threshold in the COVID-19 pandemic. As of tonight, nearly one million people have died of the virus. As David Aiken reports, there are warnings the global toll of this pandemic could get much worse in the next year. Around the world and here in Canada, protests against COVID-19 restrictions. In Madrid, Sunday, thousands in a working class neighborhood protested lockdowns that had shut down businesses. In Toronto, Saturday, hundreds protested mask regulations. But public health authorities in Canada and globally are warning masks and some regional lockdowns are vital to what the government of Canada is calling a second wave of transmissions. We really are at a crossroads with COVID right now. The global death count from COVID-19 is about to hit 1 million. And in Canada and elsewhere, the number of new cases is on the rise. That has prompted a warning from the World Health Organization that deaths could hit 2 million before a vaccine is available. We look uh, at uh, losing a million people in nine months and then we just look at the realities of getting vaccine out there in the next nine months. It's a big task for everyone involved. Indeed, that task was the dominant theme at the just concluded Leaders Week at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. Whoever finds the vaccine must share it. This is a global responsibility and it's a moral responsibility for a vaccine to be shared far and wide. Almost all leaders spoke to the near-empty UN General Assembly Hall via video conference. In his taped address, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi vowed that India's vaccine production and delivery capacity will be used to help all humanity in fighting this crisis. Uh, Canada's new ambassador to the UN, Bob Ray, introduced Justin Trudeau. Right Honourable Justin Trudeau. Trudeau, in his speech, said multilateral institutions like the UN have never been more important and that global cooperation on vaccine development is crucial. 
Let's use our shared power, not just to get a vaccine, but to get it out to everyone. The Canadian government has already spent millions of dollars to reserve millions of candidate vaccine doses. When it comes to that spending to fight the virus, my message to Canadians is, we will do whatever it takes. Indeed, on Monday in the House of Commons, MPs will debate new legislation that calls for spending an additional $4.5 billion on vaccine research and development. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. In Melbourne, Australia, the world's toughest restrictions are easing. That's because there's been a dramatic drop in new cases. The state of Victoria recorded just 60 new cases in the last 24 hours, down from over 670 at the height of the outbreak in July. Starting tomorrow, Melbourne's citywide nighttime curfew will be scrapped. Residents can now return to work. Next month, primary school students will return to the classroom. But there will be fines up to $5,000 to ensure people don't break the five-person limit on gatherings. In Portugal's capital, thousands joined protests calling for the minimum wage to be increased and better protection of jobs that are being impacted by bans on international travel. Portugal relies heavily on tourism. In August, unemployment rose above 400,000. That's up by more than 33 percent compared to the same time last year. Coming up, the political showdown over Donald Trump's Supreme Court pick. There are calls for calm as a conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan heats up. Both nations are on war footing tonight, accusing one another of reigniting violence in a long disputed territory. At least 16 people have been killed and more than 100 wounded. The two former Soviet countries have been in a standoff for nearly 30 years over the breakaway region known as Nagorno-Karabakh. The territory is inside Azerbaijan, but it's been under the control of ethnic Armenians for more than 20 years. Separatist factions in the enclave want independence. With the escalation in fighting, Armenia declared martial law and a full mobilization of its military. Azerbaijan's leader says his country is carrying out a counteroffensive. Americans can expect a showdown in the U.S. Senate beginning October 12th. That's when Republicans and Democrats will fight over President Donald Trump's nomination for the Supreme Court. Democrats are concerned Amy Coney Barrett's confirmation could threaten abortion rights, same-sex marriage and health care. As Jennifer Johnson reports, the battle has only just begun. A battle is brewing on Capitol Hill. In just over two weeks, the U.S. Senate will consider nominating Judge Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Republicans have the votes to fast-track the conservative judge, angering Senate Democrats. Senator Mitch McConnell, who could find no time to attend the negotiating on the coronavirus relief package, and yet when this vacancy occurred, he dropped everything. Now we're going hell-bent on getting this done before the election. At stake immediately, the high court's hearing on whether the Affordable Care Act, or ACA, is constitutional. Arguments are set for November 10th, one week after Americans cast their votes for president. Barrett has already questioned that. The American people should make no mistake about it. A vote for Judge Barrett is a vote to take away health care and its protections for over 130 million Americans. While conservatives are rallying around U.S. President Donald Trump's pick. She will defend your God-given rights and freedoms. She will. Democrats argue the newly elected president should pick the person to replace Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. A new New York Times Siena College poll shows 56 percent of Americans agree, but not Republicans. I don't know that we can make this decision or should. I, I know we shouldn't make it yeah. based on the politics of it, but uh, what our job is. That new poll also shows Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden leading President Trump 49 to 41 percent if the election were held now. On Tuesday night, Barrett's nomination will likely lead to fiery exchanges between Biden and Trump in their first televised debate. I'm focused on making sure the American people understand that they're being cut out of this process they're entitled to be part of. And the cutout is designed in order to take away the ACA and your health care in the midst of a pandemic. The candidates are expected to come out swinging with attacks centering on the COVID-19 pandemic, racial inequality, and the future of the Supreme Court. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Still ahead, the Caribbean country that wants to cut ties with the Queen.
Global National is back in two minutes. You're watching Global National. In Nova Scotia, this is the first installment of street art to show Halifax's solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. The project is part of a broader commitment by the municipality to address racism in the region. And amid months of anti-racism protests sparked by cases involving police violence against black people. The Black Lives Matter movement is fueling a push to shed ties with the monarchy in some Caribbean countries. Barbados plans to remove Queen Elizabeth as its head of state and become a republic. The island nation has been independent from British rule for more than half a century. But as Crystal Gomancing reports, its leaders say it's now time to cut all colonial ties. Sparkling clear blue water and beautiful scenery. This is what many picture when they think of Barbados. And Barbadians took another step in crafting their own image and future. It's not a divisive decision. It's not a decision that is reflective of any break with the monarchy or any disrespect. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We have an excellent relationship um, with the United Kingdom, with um, the royal family. Still, Barbados is breaking up with the Queen, removing her as the ceremonial figurehead of the island nation. The news was shared in the speech from the throne at the opening of the second session of Parliament. Barbados' first Prime Minister, the right excellent Errol Walton Barrow, cautioned against loitering on colonial premises. That warning is as relevant today as it was in 1966. 1966 was the year the country gained independence from Britain. For decades, there had been discussions about cutting all ties with the Commonwealth. Barbados was one of the oldest English colonies in the West Indies, dating back to the 17th century, and slavery was very much part of its history. Recently, there have been talks about colonial tributes, such as statues and street names, and discussions about recognizing the role slavery had in shaping Barbados and its people. Now, Prime Minister Mia Motley says it's time for full sovereignty. It is important to us that we give confidence to our young people, to that little boy, that little girl, to believe that they can become and aspire to become the head of state of their own country. Other nations, such as Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, have made the leap. The benefits of the Commonwealth have also been debated in Jamaica, Australia and Canada. But becoming a republic is complicated. For example, in countries such as Canada, Indigenous treaties are with the Crown. And the Constitution sets a balance between provinces, territories and the federal government. So you would have to get the provinces to agree to give up on the crown and ask PEI, who is an equal partner to Ontario in, federation, in our federation, if they'll ever give up the crown. So as an institution for provincial independence, I don't ever see them wanting to get rid of it. Even Quebec maintains their, the office of the lieutenant governor. You don't see it, but it's there. Barbados has had two constitutional reviews and only needed a two-third majority in parliament to remove the queen. The official move will happen next November, in time for the country's 55th anniversary of independence. Crystal Gamancing, Global News, London. Coming up, is it an asteroid or something else about to enter Earth's orbit? A dazzling light display could be seen in the skies over parts of Finland. The northern lights, or aurora borealis, glowed for hours. The end of September is a good time to catch the show, which is a result of electrically charged particles from the sun entering Earth's atmosphere. The natural light show was also seen above parts of northern Canada. It sounds made up, but a mini-moon is a very real space phenomenon. It happens when an asteroid gets caught in Earth's gravitational pull, then temporarily starts orbiting our planet. But one object entering our orbit later this year is raising the eyebrows of astronomers, because as Mike Drolet explains, it doesn't look like an asteroid. The mighty Centaur is on its pad at Cape Canaveral. For NASA fired a lot of Centaur rockets into the atmosphere in the 1960s. Malfunction. They didn't all work out. But that was the trial and error part of the space race. 
1966, a Centaur rocket carrying the Surveyor 2 spaceship malfunctioned close to the moon. Part of it crashed, but the Centaur spun off into space, never to be seen again. I mean, you know, we were very, um, shall I say, flippant in the 60s with respect to the uh, the upper stages of vehicles. We, we launched lots of vehicles to the moon during the 60s. We launched lots off to Mars and to Venus, and we really didn't care what happened to the upper stages. Fast forward to the present, and astronomers have found an object deep in space they named 2020 SO. In December, it will temporarily get caught in Earth's gravity and orbit the planet, becoming what's known as a mini-moon except it might not be an asteroid. I think, you know, what's piqued people's interest and, and definitely my interest is, you know, the possibility that this might be, you know, a human-made object that was launched. They did the math, lots of math, and concluded it was going far too slow to be an asteroid. So they did more math and determined not only that it was the same size as the Centaur rocket, but that it was on the same trajectory as the one they lost in 1966. In recent years, we've seen some amazing images of asteroids, like this one in 2013 that lit up the Russian sky, as well as oddly shaped objects like Oumuamua that some believe was an alien spacecraft. And of course, Elon Musk added his own oddity when he launched a Tesla into space. And maybe that will become a mini moon in the future, who knows? It's that unknown that continues to intrigue us. And come December, hopefully we get a clearer picture of our temporary mini moon, man-made or not. Mike Drillet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Sunday. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is 20 Mile Creek in Ontario's Niagara region. Thank you for watching. Donna Friesen will be back here tomorrow. Good night.